Hello and welcome to ADB Insight. The world finds itself right now at the crossroads of growth. Decades of hard fought for prosperity should be pointing towards a positive and inclusive future for all of us. But with deglobalization and geopolitical tensions on the rise, plus the climate clock ticking, risks and uncertainties abound. So what will it take to bridge us to the future we all hope for? I'm Nisha Pillay, and it's my pleasure to be joined today by our esteemed panelists, the president of EBRD, Odile Renaud Basso, the finance minister of Georgia, His Excellency Lasha Kutsishvili, and our host, the president of ADB, Masatsugu Asakawa. Now let's start with an economic overview. President Massa, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Okay. We are living through turbulent times, aren't we? There is so much uncertainty around geopolitics, over trade relationships. What does all this mean for economic prospects of the Asia-Pacific region, which, after all, has been the, the engine of global growth for so long? So let me start by talking briefly about the economic outlook in the region. Uh, the economies of so-called developing Asia is estimated uh, to have grown at 5.0 percent uh, last year, 2023, uh, up from 4.3 percent in the previous year, 2022. And uh, this gross momentum is expected uh, to be sustained uh, at around 4.9 percent this year and next year. On the other hand, inflation has been contained uh, well. Uh, actually, in inflation rate itself uh, dropped uh, from 4.4 percent in 2022 to 3.3% in 2023. And this robust, robust growth uh, com, com, comes from a couple of uh, factors. First, uh, relatively strong domestic demand. Uh, second, recovery of uh, export performance thanks to the favorable semiconductor cycle. And third, very strong uh, remittance inflow into the region. Fourth, recovery of uh, tourism. Uh, the more and more, more, and more uh, tourists are coming back. And fifth, the recover, recovery of the Chinese economy. And uh, talking of Chinese economy a bit, uh, uh, China uh, only uh, you know, grew by 3.0% uh, in 2022, but it rebounded back to 5.2% growth in 2023 uh, after they exited from very st strict uh, 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 zero corona policy. So looking ahead, it looks like Asian and Pacific economy uh, appear to be uh, very resilient, although they are facing a tremendous amount of you know, uncertainties and uh, challenges. I would like to list up uh, four challenges. One is, as you mentioned, uh, Nisha, ongoing geopolitical conflicts in Middle East and others. Second, possibility of uh, very unstable uh, global financial markets due to the monetary policy orientation in advanced economies, especially in the U.S. Uh, thirdly, a uh, food uh, security issue. Uh, while uh, the food price in general has been declining after its peak in 2022, the rice price has been uh, rising. I was shocked to know that the rice price actually soared more than 40% uh, last year, 2023, uh, which eroded substantially the purchasing power of poor families in our region. In order to deal with this food security issue, uh, ADB announced uh, uh, two years ago a $14 billion financial package, comprehensive financial package, mainly investment in the agricultural sector uh, in our region to make it more re resilient vis-a-vis uh, -vis any uh, kind of external shocks. And fourth uh, uh, risk, so downside risks we are facing is uh, climate change crisis. And uh, actually, it's an uh, uncomfortable truth uh, that the uh, Asian Pacific region is accountable for uh, more than 50% of CO2 ga gas emission. But at the same time, it is uh, also truth uh, that this region is one of the most vulnerable region uh, area vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, natural disaster. Everybody saw what happened in Pakistan two years ago, right? Uh, so I always say, our fight against uh, climate, climate change will be won or lost in Asia and Pacific. Wow, I'm going to pick you up on that a little later on, President mm -hmm. Massa, what ADB is doing in the fight against climate change. So, Odile Renaud-Basso, 
the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. You have such a broad remit, don't you? Not just in the post-communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but also the Southern Mediterranean, in Central Asia, and now in North Africa. Could you give us a quick economic snapshot of your three main client countries, Ukraine, Turkey, and Egypt, which for various different reasons are all suffering from significant economic crises? So yes, very different situation. Ukraine, um, the country is uh, under war, under the Russian attack, started in February 2022. So in 2022, huge economic recession, minus 30% of GDP, because a part of the country is really uh, in a war zone when, I mean, activity is uh, very, very limited. But the positive news in this very difficult environment is that uh, economy stabilized in 2023, mainly thanks to huge budget support under the under the remit of the IMF program. So it's even positive growth by uh, plus 5% in 2023. So this rebound is, is a positive sign because it helps I mean, the country sustaining economic activities, companies continue to invest. So it showed that, I mean, there is, I mean, the situation is improving. But of course, it's very fragile. It's very much dependent on external support. And because the budget deficit represents around 50% of the budget. So it's, it's a huge, I mean, a very exceptional and difficult uh, situation. But I hope that the, being the the forecast for 2024 is still a positive growth of, of 5%. And Inflation has been kept under control. So 2022, big inflation, sort of monetary financing for the, for the war effort. And, and then this came down under, come back under control in 2023. Turkey is completely different uh, situation. They had years of very unorthodox economic policy with, with um, I mean, decrease of interest rates, very high level of inflation, a bit of overheating, uh, but still, amazing resilience from the Turkish private sector and from the Turkish economy. And then a few months ago, they really revert economic, macroeconomic course, tightening that start to tighten monetary policy, which I mean, raising very substantially uh, rates. And inflation remains at high level. But I think that, I mean, it will progressively uh, slow down. And um, to be fair, I mean, I think that the resilience of the Turkish economy is, is quite amazing and the capacity of the private sector banking sector to adjust to this situation. So we continue to support them despite this, this economic situation, and I, I think it was the right decision to take. Egypt is in a different um, uh, situation. It has been uh, quite impacted by uh, increase of energy, food prices, um, economic growth has been, uh, has been slow, um, huge uh, financing needs. So the situation was, I mean, lack of foreign currency, slowing down investment. The growth was very much dependent on uh, public sector investment, um, huge, which are needed because the uh, demographic dynamics are very strong, but uh, private sector dynamic is not so good. So um, the good news for Egypt is that um, they reach a, a, an agreement with IMF. They got uh, wide support from uh, some Gulf countries, uh, from the EU and so forth. So the, this gives them some um, margin of maneuver in terms of uh, access to foreign currency, level of reserve. So I, I think they will, they will stay on track uh, in the framework of this program. Okay, good to hear that. So it sounds like you're positive about all three of these big client countries for EBRD. Finance Minister Lasha. So let's turn to Georgia now. The economy has been on a real roller coaster with being very badly hit during COVID and then buoyed by a surge of migrants coming in after the Russian war in Ukraine started. What's the situation now? Is it stabilizing? What do you see as the main economic challenges and opportunities? She very well summarized the recent economic uh, challenges, which came comes from the uh, from the pandemic, of course, and from the Russia's invasion in Ukraine and ongoing war. So, but beside that, so in the last decade, Georgia was facing four times uh, economic shocks, and so it was to mention that all the time, country's economy showed a quite strong resilience to to the shocks. Uh, so what is important uh, from that part is that uh, the policies we are performing 
and the structural reforms which we are uh, doing in new policies. So it shows uh, quite good basis for the economic recovery we have. So there are the several factors because uh, for several reasons why we had the quite strong economic recovery process in the country. Among them is the quite strong uh, recovery of the tourism sector, which was and still is the quite big part of our economy. So before the COVID, it was up to 12 percent uh, of our GDP. Uh, of course, the uh, foreign di direct investment that increased for the last three years period was very significant and in general, so the business attractive business climate, one of the uh, important factors. Capital and human inflows also uh, have the, its uh, share in our uh, growth and in general, so the quite strong demand. So as a result of these factors, uh, in 2021 and 2022, Georgia had a two-digit uh, economic growth, 10.6% in 2021 and 11% uh, in 2022. This growth momentum continued uh, last year as we had a 7.5% growth, which is the higher, much more higher than the average uh, growth. And this growth is uh, continuing even this year for the last two months period. So our growth was at 7.7%. Uh, so uh, besides the, the facts, we, we, can, we see that we had a quite strong fiscal consolidation measures and we have a quite strong reforms in public finance management, which plays its role uh, stabilizing the economy. So the budget deficit, which was about 9%, around 9%, so it declined up to 2.5%, and debt level, which was around 61%, declined more than 20 percentage point below 40%. So the main challenge, one of the main challenge during this period, which was the inflation also destabilized, and for the last 12 months, in inflation in Georgia, average inflation is 0.7%. Uh, one of the most heated uh, component also was the uh, current account deficit during the COVID period. And so we see that last year it was a 4.3%, which is a historically best uh, performance. So as of, as of today, we can say that the macroeconomic stability uh, reached the country macroeconomic stability, and we will continue with the, the, the same uh, track. So. He, Despite the, all these challenges which, which the country was facing during the uh, crisis, so we see that the economy showed a quite strong resilience. And now Georgia is preparing its economy and its systems for EU integration, and at the same time keeping strategic cooperation within the region. So it sounds like the very strong growth has been an opportunity to really get your economic house in order. Um, thank you very much. FM Lasha. So let's turn our attention now to another theme, what's called MDB evolution, the way multilateral development banks are changing to address the pressing needs of today, including the climate crisis, geopolitical tensions, and the redrawing of trade ties. Now, multilateral development banks play a key role in meeting these challenges, but are they really doing enough? MDBs are under pressure to evolve to fundamentally change the way they operate. So let's take a closer look at that now. And President Odil, I'd like to put the first question to you, if I may. What is EBRD doing to rise to this challenge then, to do more and faster to meet the SDGs, to meet the climate goals, with the clock ticking? So, I mean, we really embrace this agenda of better, uh, bigger, and more effective MDBs, which is a bit, I mean, driving um, in the direction. And um, we worked on the, on the size and how to unlock, um, I mean, capacity to invest more. And in particular, because of we are big investors, uh, largest investor in Ukraine, it represents specific risk, and you need to have capital buffer to be able to sustain investment in such an environment. So we. Uh, 
worked a lot on how to optimize our capital, and uh, there were a report which has dri driven the agenda, which is called, I mean, the Capital Adequacy Framework Report, um, done under the auspices of the G20, which gave some direction on how to leverage and, and so forth. We also benefited from um, capital support from our shareholders in the form of a capital increase that gives us the capacity to continue to invest in Ukraine in this very uncertain environment and the challenging environment, while also supporting all our countries of operation. So that's for the size. For the priorities, I think climate is, is for us a key priority. 50% of our investment must be in the climate sector. And we look at all the investment we do under the lenses of the Paris alignment. So we need to check that all investments we, uh, we are doing are consistent, uh, compatible with the Paris Agreement. We are focusing mainly on the private sector as a bank, so 70% of our financing is in the private sector, and we really try to help our clients to address this agenda to decarbonize, to improve energy efficiency, and um, et cetera. And in a way, the energy crisis that has hit on quite a lot of countries uh, in the context of the war has also been an accelerator for, um, energy, for energy efficiency development of renewable. So picking up on what we just heard from President Odile, President Massa, you said earlier, I'm going to quote, our fight against climate change will be won or lost in the Asia-Pacific. So what is ADB doing to address this challenge? Mm -hmm. I should say, what are you doing differently now? OK. Well, as Odile said, mentioned, uh, under the MDB evolution agenda, MDBs are now asked to deal with uh, you know, global public goods, uh, for example, climate change issue, and also global health issue, and so on. And uh, in, my, in my view, uh, this uh, agenda of MDB evolution can be broken down into three sub-agendas. First, what we should focus on. Second, how much more we should finance. Third, how we should work. Uh, the first sub-agenda, uh, what we should focus on, it's uh, climate change is a good example. So let's take up uh, climate change issue as an example. Uh, ADB has been very uh, proactive uh, to address climate change issues from, from the very early days. Just before the COP26 in Glasgow in 2022, we elevated our ambition uh, to uh, 100 billion US dollars of cumulative climate financing from 2019 to 2030. And also we indicated our intention uh, that one third of 100 billion target, uh, which means 34 billion US dollars, uh, should be invested in adaptation. Uh, so adaptation should not be forgotten. Because that's particularly important in Asia. Exactly, exactly. And uh, I'm very happy to report to you uh, that in last year, in tw uh, 2023, uh, we delivered uh, $9.8 billion of climate financing, which was a uh, record high, uh, with uh, $5.5 billion in uh, mitigation and $4.3 billion in adaptation. Second thing I'd like to mention is briefly is that we have been working on a couple of uh, uh, climate-related uh, uh, financing schemes. One of them is called IFCAP, Innovative Finance Facility for Climate in Asia and Pacific, IFCAP, IFCAP. IFCAP is a very innovative financing instrument to expand ADB's uh, climate investment by utilizing guarantee uh, provided by bilateral dollars, which means whenever one dollar of ADB's sovereign uh, operation is guaranteed by any donors, we can expand uh, climate uh, investment accordingly. But the beauty of this mechanism is that it's not really uh, conventional one dollar in, one dollar out uh, financial, financial modality. Whenever one dollar is guaranteed, under our simulation, we can expand for... Oh, you the leverage effect. Yeah, exactly, four dollars ah. or even five dollars, uh, you know, of climate financing uh, because of the leverage effect you just mentioned, Nisha. I do hope that this uh, you know, innovative financing scheme would uh, greatly contribute to achieve our you know, ambition ambition of $100 billion target by 2030. That's the first sub-agenda. Second sub-agenda is how much more we should finance. Uh, on this point, I'd like to congratulate Odile uh, for your successful you know, capital increase exercise at the EBRD. But at ADB, uh, there have been no discussion about possible capital increase among our shareholders. So what we, we did uh, do uh, last year 
uh, was uh, we went through so-called capital adequacy framework review, CAF review. And uh, the purpose of CAF review is to uh, expand our lending capacity in general, lending capacity, by optimizing the prudential level of, of capitalization, which simply means, you know, we looked at our methodology uh, of uh, uh, risk management and found out that our methodology was a bit too conservative compared with our peers, institutions like EBRD. So we decided to align our methodology to those of actually EBRD and the IADB. And as a result, uh, this review uh, you know, ended up with uh, un un unlocking additional 100 billion US dollars, once again, uh, of additional lending capacity for the next 10 years, which means uh, 10 billion per year, 40% uh, more than the current level. So I would say our CAF review was really great, uh, greatly successful. And finally, on the third sub-agenda, how we should work. Uh, let me just briefly mention that uh, last year we embarked on a very substantial, uh, huge organizational restructuring called NOM, non-operating mo uh, models. And uh, the purpose of NOM is very simple, uh, break, break down the silos we are seeing uh, in many places in our organizations, like silos between sovereign and non-sovereign operations, silos between uh, operational department and non-operational department and so on. And uh, also in order to uh, make our climate investment more effective and also to make mobilization of uh, uh, private sector capital uh, more efficiently. And also we are sending more and more staff from headquarters uh, to resident mission in order to uh, closer uh, to the clients. Yeah, that's and that's a really important point, yeah. So one of the places they may be moving to is Georgia, because Georgia is, of course, a client of both EBRD and ADB. So if I could ask you, Finance Minister Lasha, what do you think countries like Georgia can do to work more effectively with MDBs? And what do you think that MDBs themselves should be doing more of or less of? Well, the fact that the Georgia has a very good cooperation with the BRD and the ADB, and generally with the all uh, MDBs which cover the region, is the huge opportunity for Georgia itself to, to have a very diversified portfolio and also to benefit with the quite uh, different uh, financial instruments which the MDBs uh, is providing to, to the country. So financial uh, cooperation and the cooperation with the MDBs is important not only from the financial perspective but the expertise which is provided from the MDBs during the very complex infrastructural projects or uh, institutional reforms, that's also very uh, important for the uh, countries like Georgia. So we have a quite good experience of working together uh, on the same projects as uh, several MDBs like uh, EBRD and ADB is financing very important uh, highway project in Georgia, uh, in Kwesheti Kwesh Kwesh Kobi, which is uh, more than 400 million euros project and we, we, which uh, is very important from the logistical uh, perspective. So the, this is the opportunity to benefit from the synergy of the different IFIs uh, together. So we, Georgia is benefiting much from the, this kind of the cooperation. And I can say that also it should be important for the MDBs having the client like Georgia because uh, for we see how what are the main challenges uh, of the MDBs and what, what are the, the challenges MDBs by its operation and what is the regional context of it. So what would you like to see them do more of? Today is what is visible and so the most of the developing countries uh, facing this uh, issue is high indebtedness. And at the same time, it's a huge need of the uh, uh, investing in the infrastructure and other projects, but with a quite shrunk uh, fiscal space. So that's something after the COVID period, COVID pandemic, uh, every country, every developing country was, was facing. So in this process, I think that the MDB's role is very, role is very important uh, to introduce uh, different financial instruments to answer these challenges. 
One of them might be the uh, local currency borrowing, which we have good experience with the BRD, but this practice is something that we, we should uh, continue. That, that uh, issue is quite important for many countries. Some of them managed to recover from the COVID period, some of them couldn't, but for the long-term period, so this is something that it, this issue should be addressed uh, together uh, with, 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 with the MDBs and the, the, the clients. So this is opportunity because the local currency borrowing will unlock much more opportunity to financing with, with, with this limited fiscal space. I think that uh, all the MDBs, we will address this issue and that, that will be the opportunity to even the strengthen the, our cooperation. And it's also important that from that, from the, with this instrument, so it's a, a good chance to reform and to develop the local, local currency markets as well. Yes, and I understand that both EBRD and ADB have been recently involved in issuing local currency bonds in George and Lari. So that process is now underway, as it were. I wonder if we could move on to another theme, which I believe is very close to your heart. Finance Minister Lasher, you mentioned the highways, and that is regional cooperation and connectivity. It seems to be one of the economic pillars in Georgia, building regional cooperation and connectivity. Why is that? Why is it so important to you? So you know that Georgia is positioning itself as a uh, crossroad to, to the Europe and uh, Asia. And so the one of the pillar of our uh, economic policy is also the, to strengthen our uh, uh, transit potential in the country. So the highways where we are investing billions of uh, dollars uh, through the IFIS assistance, also the, the railway, also the new ports uh, in the country. All of these infrastructural projects serve the purpose to increase the transit potential in the country. And that's part of the many initiatives which serves the regional cooperation, like Middle Corridor, Silk Road, and other initiatives, which is uh, main purpose is to increase the regional cooperation. So the country is benefiting much from this kind of the uh, initiatives and we, we, we think that we will continue to invest in the, this kind of the projects. I will say that one of the f main and one of the important projects which is a uh, flagship project between Georgia and EU cooperation is the under Black Sea electricity cable which is already the flagship project that it's already under EU investment uh, plan. And this kind of the project serves the purpose that we, we will have the connectivity, direct connectivity to uh, European Union and as well as it's a huge opportunity for, for the country to export the renewable uh, energy to the European Union. Because uh, if you will see the structure of the uh, electricity generation in Georgia, it's more than 80% of the electricity generation is a green and renewable, mainly come from the uh, hydro and the wind. So Georgia is clearly very optimistic about the potential for exploiting its, its strategic position right there between Asia and Europe. But these projects could cost a lot of money and there is a lot of engineering challenge as well, for instance, with the deep sea cable. So I wonder if I could ask you, President Odile, what's your perspective, what's the EBRD's perspective on the potential for the middle corridor? We have worked a lot on this issue because we realized study uh, on the medial corridor uh, with uh, EU financing because of and I, what we believe is that with a geopolitical challenge, the situation with, the situation with Russia, trade between um, Asia and Europe um, needs an alternative uh, infrastructure and, and the middle corridor is the best, I mean, um, most effective connectivity channel. So um, we are really looking at that and investing and because we are working also in Central Asia, Kazakhstan and, and uh, other Central Asian countries. So we are making some, I mean, 
mean investing in some projects which are related to the middle corridor. I think our study shows that the overall amount of investment needed would be around 18.5 billion. Or, but of course, nothing. I mean, it's not all um, urgent, and um, you, it could be phased and, and prioritized. But we are working on that in the different countries, and it's important to have this global view so as to ensure that the dots are connected. Uh, one important dimension also is soft connectivity. So it's not only Ensure, in improving the connectivity is not only about infrastructure, road, railway, port, and so forth, digital infrastructure, but also about processes to, you know, customs uh, processes, digitalization of customs, and so forth, facilitating transit uh, across countries. And so that these are things which are not so costly, but are also very important in improving uh, the connectivity and the smooth transit of goods um, across across the different countries. So this is clearly a priority uh, for in, of in investment for us and um, and we believe that part of it should be done with I mean public sector investment but we are also keen to explore the feasibility of PPPs you know bringing in private investors in order to alleviate the burden on the public finance. Thank you so much Odile. Um, President Marceau can we just step back for a minute and look at the bigger picture here we're talking about bolstering trade through Georgia through from Asia to Europe. Um, but do you see that there's maybe um, further benefits from regional cooperation mm. at a time when protectionism is on the rise? Could it support efforts to stabilize globalization? Yeah, very important uh, points, I think. Uh, it has been sometimes said that uh, COVID-19 and also in a couple of uh, geopolitical t tensions, conflicts uh, in the Middle, Middle East and others have halted. Uh, the trend of globalization. They say our world will be uh, end, uh, ending up with serious segmentation in our society and so, uh, econ economy and so on. Personally, I don't buy this kind of argument at all. Uh, if anything, uh, COVID-19, for example, pandemic, reminded us how deeply our world is interconnected. So diversification to in order to reduce uh, you know concentration cost may take place it is taking place but purely a segmentation uh, couldn't be a solution so i think i do believe that the globalization will come back then what we should do is to recognize other benefit uh, arising from free trade and free uh, movement of capitals through which especially our region have benefited for years a couple of important uh, uh, points here. Uh, first, uh, we should fight against any form of pr protectionism. Uh, we should promote uh, open trade, uh, free trade, uh, not only bilaterally but also multilaterally. Second, we should really deepen cooperation effort. Uh, I do believe that you know, as long as any uh, regional region is open and transparent, it would not compete with globalization. It would complement globalization. For example, uh, we could uh, promote uh, a more diversified uh, regional supply chain to s complement our global supply chain. Uh, we could uh, consider to enhance uh, regional cooperation, uh, regional financial cooperation, to prepare for the uh, future currency contingency. Uh, for example, Chenma Initiative of ASEAN plus three countries. Or, or we could enhance uh, regional cooperation in inter international taxation in the context of BEPS initiative, uh, Best Erosion Profit Shifting initiative, which has been agreed by almost 140 countries and jurisdictions a couple of years ago. Uh, thirdly and finally, I do think that we should also take care of the negative aspect of, of globalization, uh, namely global uh, value chain uh, related uh, emission has grown very rapidly, even more rapidly than other sources of uh, uh, emission. So this global value chain's increasing contribution uh, to uh, global emission uh, really highlights the urgent need to decarbonize a global value chain and regional value chain. Absolutely. Thank you very much, President Massa. Finance Minister Lasha, if I may ask you, Georgia is for the first time hosting the ADB annual meeting. It has the theme, Bridge to the Future. What does that mean for you? What does it mean for Georgia to be a bridge to the future? So there was uh, several reasons why we chose this uh, slogan, Preach to the Future. Uh, the first is that uh, we position ourselves as a bridge between the Europe and Asia. 
Also, we are hosting this very important event at a very crucial time for Georgia as a EU candidate country. And also, we all are recovering from the COVID pandemic and we all are dealing with the regional crisis. And last but not least, so the Georgia is an ancient country with the, with the ancient history, with the very modern society and very bright young generation, which also highlights the fact that the country is going to forward. And the ambitions of the country. Thank you so much, um, Finance Minister Lasha. Um, President Odile, so talking of ambitions, multilateral development banks have very ambitious agendas. EBRD is no exception. Where would you like to see EBRD in, let's say, by 2030? I would like to see the EBRD, I mean, being successful in um, investing in uh, the countries in which we operate, uh, probably with higher level of investment, but also, I mean, having had a an impact on uh, the green transition, on digitalization, on inclusion, which are our current, on governance, also the quality of governance, which is a very important condition to improve a private sector environment and attract business. So I think that, in a way, uh, you know, if in 2030 we are less needed in, the, in some countries, it would be very good news. But um, another challenge we have for 2030, so I hope we will be uh, in the middle of our very well advanced in the reconstruction of Ukraine and that um, the country will be in peace and um, reconstructed. And uh, we will start to invest in sub Sub-Saharan African countries and that we will be successful there and really helping this region which is uh, facing a number of challenges. Big agenda there, clearly. President Massa, where would you like to see ADB by 2030? Crystallise it for us. What does it mean to be a bridge to the future for ADB? Yeah, I think for ADB is to be a good bridge to the future. I think three factors are very important. First is appropriate climate action. Second is mobilisation of private uh, sector capital. A third one is uh, you know enhance uh, our regional cooperation to complement globalisation as we discussed. And especially if uh, these three factors are combined together, I think uh, MDB is, would be, uh, could be a very you know, powerful tool uh, to uh, address the challenges we are now currently facing. Quite recently, I visited Rao PDL uh, to where we provided financing to build a large-scale uh, wind farm uh, project and 600 megawatt wind farm. And we could, first of all, we could uh, mobilize a huge amount of private uh, financing uh, to this project. ADB provided just 100 million, uh, which at attracted 600 million uh, from the private sector uh, investment. So all, all together, uh, this uh, project has become one billion project, and uh, this uh, wind farm would be, become the largest wind farm uh, in Southeast Asia. So I think the, in this project, these three uh, factors are beautifully combined. Uh, it all together and uh, so I felt uh, this uh, project very attractive and I hope that this kind of project, innovative project, would be uh, replicated in other uh, country in the region and also other region in the world. And uh, finally, Russia, thank you very much for uh, hosting IDB annual meeting this year uh, to discuss Bridge to the Future. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing many people in Tbilisi. Indeed, I would like to wish you all a very impactful and insightful ADB annual meeting too in Tbilisi coming up. We've had such a rich discussion here. I'd like to thank you all very much for sparing your time for us. Your Excellency Finance Minister Lasha Khudsichuli, President Odile Renaud Basso, and of course our host, President Asakawa. Thank you for joining us on ADB Insight. From me, Nisha Pile. thank you to you all for joining us. From me and the team, I should say, the ADB Insight team. We've been so pleased to have your company. See you again soon.